that's a background question. Okay. Thanks. Turn it all up. Yes. Except for Can we get rid of the background noise? And turn off the virtual because everyone's flying. I don't, I don't know why I'm getting background noise. Should we turn up the volume on this uh, in the speakers here? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> okay. Anybody who's not muted, can you please mute? Because we're getting a lot of background. It's coming from the hall. There's a, okay. People, people in the hall talking. Yeah, okay, okay. I guess there's not much we can do about that. Okay, so. Okay, we'll start again here. Okay, so Ron was a scientist photographer at Simon Fraser University for 36 years, during which he picked up a great deal of biology. He also developed a lifelong interest in native plants and making beautiful photographs of wildflowers became his favorite personal activity. After retirement, he expanded his wildflower photography to botanical hotspots around the world. If you missed his presentation on chasing wild orchids and other botanical adventures in Western Australia, you can still find it in the recording on our website. And if you haven't seen it, I'd advise you to go and take a look at it. Uh, on our trip to Costa Rica in 2015, we realized- a wonderful one on uh, wildflowers of Australia that we enjoyed so much. Mm -hmm. You can't hear me, can you? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Well, turn it off. Just yeah. Elizabeth, no, been, nobody here can hear you. I can hear. Yeah. Elizabeth is doing this great introduction for me. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to do an introduction for you, but like <laughs> it's not working too well here. <laughs> okay, so on a trip to Costa One more second here. Okay. Well, they can't hear me. Okay. Um, Trip to Costa Rica in 2015, Ron realized that birds also presented opportunities for beautiful photography if they were done right. In Ron's talks, the beautiful photographs are supplemented by little known facts about the biology of the, of the subject. On this trip, he's going to take a close look at two regions of Brazil the Pantanal, the largest undisturbed wetland in the world. I don't know how large that is, but I'm sure Ron will tell us. Um, there are only two roads, but rivers provide almost unlimited access. Travel by small boat with a local guide reveals a hard to believe diversity of birds and other wildlife, all of which for the most part, ignore the boat and allow unequal photographic opportunities. The Atlantic rainforest, which could easily qualify as a last chance destination, Little is left of one of the most historically prolific wildlife regions of Brazil, but with a knowledgeable guide, a taste of the bird diver diver diversity, excuse me, can be still be found and it's amazing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ron to take us on a wonderful trip around Brazil and the beautiful mm -hmm. birds. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Elizabeth. And hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, <laughs> this is gonna be the first ever uh, of me sitting down to do a to do a presentation, but I guess you don't have to be able to see me. Um, is there someone you can get a microphone? He has one. The presentation is starting, but there's this this hybrid meeting format's not working out that well. Doesn't look before. I don't know what's going on. Let me mute a whole bunch of people out there. Yeah. Two chairs again. Picture. They don't. They're not being able to put the screen directly onto the. The. Thing. Right. They're. They've got a. An iPhone, clamped to a chair back to a, looking at the screen on the, in the room. Ryan, mute yourself. I don't know what's going to happen if I have um, my um, microphone on. I'll probably squeal at you. But... No, it's on now. Okay. So you should really go ahead, I guess. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm going to try and try and speak out. So. <laughs> um, 
the, the, these pictures are from the last trip I made before COVID shut us all down. So this was uh, 2019. And um, I, I started, my first title was The Birds of, of uh, The Beautiful Birds of Brazil. And then I realized, well, there was one or two that I had missed on this trip. So I, I had to admit that it was just some of the birds of Brazil. Um, so everybody's familiar with the Amazon basin. It, it's easy to, to uh, pick out. Uh, it may seem obvious why somebody would go to Brazil uh, to see birds, but I doubt very much that many people realize just how special Brazil is. Um, Brazil is probably the most biodiverse uh, country in the world. Uh, Brazil is, has 1,823 confirmed bird species, of which 283 are endemic to Brazil. Compare that to Canada. We've got a total of about 690 bird species and no endemics. Um, and Brazil is a million square miles smaller than Canada. So it's a pretty incredible place. Um, and you don't just go to Brazil and start looking for birds. Uh, so we're, as Elizabeth said, going to concentrate on just two uh, areas. Um, the Amazon basin is well known and, and is easily recognized from the map, uh, but we're not going there. Uh, we're going to the Pantanal, which is a, a much uh, smaller and more difficult to find. But it's the Pantanal is also a basin. It's surrounded by mountains and um, it's rainfall in the mountains that cause the floods in the, uh, in the Pantanal each year. Um, the Pantanal is about the size of the United Kingdom. Um, and that makes the Pantanal the largest undeveloped wetland in the world. Uh, the Pantanal covers more than 65,000 square miles, 80% of which is submerged during the rainy season. Uh, you've probably heard of this referred to as the flooded forest. Interesting enough, there's not much forest there. The biodiversity biodiversity of the Pantanal is incredible. Um, and for that reason, it's a world biosphere reserve. The reptiles uh, include caiman, snakes, uh, and lizards, the amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders. Um, the Pantanal has two thirds of the birds. Uh, uh, the Pantanal alone has two thirds of the birds that occur in all of Canada. And it's the uh, the birds that we're primarily here to look at. So we flew into Cuyaba and immediately from the airport headed out on Trans Pantanera Road, which is one of the only two roads uh, in the Pantanal. Uh, this is a hundred miles of raised dirt road which is stitched together with 122 wooden bridges. Um, and by the way, Pan Pantanal is a Portuguese word. Um, well, it's taken from the Portuguese word Pantano, which means wetland, bog, swamp, quagmire, or marsh. And Pantanal qualifies on all of those accounts. Uh, the first day we didn't go very far. We stopped for two, two nights at a lodge and immediately we're into the birds. Uh, and th this was just the, uh, the introduction. Uh, the Topo toucan at 25 inches in length is the largest of the toucans and has the largest bill with respect to body size of all birds. Uh, it has a lifespan typically of 20 years. Uh, the wingspan is, is only 20 inches, so, so that, they're poor flyers. Uh, and they're preyed on by jaguars, snakes, and, and eagles. So they generally hang out in groups as protection from 
uh, from predators. They have very strong feet and toes. And uh, so th that's an adaptation to the uh, bird's preferred method of moving around, uh, uh, like such as walking and hopping among tree branches rather than flying. The tupials are the same family as orioles and meadow, meadow larks, and you, you can certainly see the, the resemblance. This one's about nine inches long. They feed on fruits and, uh, and insects, um, and uh, also uh, sips nectar from flowers. That's something I noticed that many of these birds uh, are very versatile in, um, in their feeding. These guys are nest pirates. They, they take over uh, Oriole-like hanging nests of other birds. They use one nest to raise their young, but then the, the, the member of the pair who is not on the eggs occupies a different nest. Uh, so the breeding pair will steal two nests from, uh, from other birds. The yellow rump cacique is um, about a foot long. The males are highly territorial and they're polygynous. So that's how you say it. Um, Males, I, I love this. Males form sequential consortships with one to 27 females. That sounds like a heck of a concept to me. Uh, but the males guard the, their concept, con, consorts. That's what it says online. Uh, didn't explain how they were going to do that. But uh, so. These guys make up to a uh, hundred uh, nests in a tree, uh, which also usually contains an active wasp nest. The wasp nest provides us some protection from mammals and bot flies. And uh, this is one of the nests that's often stolen by the trupial that we that we just saw. Uh, in a colony, they uh, they can mob predatory birds. Uh, apparently, the wasps also will protect the colony from monkeys. And they tend to nest on islands, uh, which is a protection from snakes. Uh, caiman and giant otters prey on swimming snakes. Pretty clever of the birds, I'd say. And the... Um, the, the colony uh, includes abandoned nests as well as the active nests. And uh, so that's that uh, acts sort of like uh, uh, as camouflage for the for the uh, nest with with uh, eggs or baby birds. Uh, this ibis is uh, quite big, 36 inches long, and uh, its diet diet includes uh, snails, uh, um, and uh, snails, mollusks, and fish. Um, there's you can just make out a gap in the beak. That that seems to be related to feeding on snails because I noticed that same feature on a snail feeding bird in Africa. Um, the caracaras. 26 inches long, wingspan of four feet. These are, are supposedly predators, but they often forage on the ground for insects. And, uh, but they, if they do get on uh, a food source, uh, like an animal carcass, uh, it can be quite, quite aggressive where it displaces uh, black vultures and turkey vultures. And it also steals food from other raptors uh, and gulls and, and pelicans. So they say that uh, this has one of the most diverse diets of all raptors. It'll eat anything it can catch and even eats fruit. This is a large tyrant flycatcher. It's a body length about eight and a half inches, wingspan of of 16 inches. I bet nobody knows what 
a group of king birds is called. Come on, you hardcore birders. Well, that's nice. I can teach you something. It's called a coronation. <laughs> but there's uh, there's other alternatives. It could might might be referred to as a a court of kingbirds or a tyranny of kingbirds. Um, it's very aggressive. It uh, it perches conspicuously and will fly out to convert any sort of bird that comes too close to the nest. Um, and uh, they will even go after uh, much larger birds, such as frigate birds and toucans, caracaras, and hawks. Impressive little guy. Uh, and this is one that I found really encouraging. It's reported that the population is increasing. That's the only bird that I found that notation to be, to be connected with. Uh, this is not a hummingbird. In fact, it's about 15 inches long. Uh, it's a ground nesting bird. The uh, eggs are laid in a burrow in a in a bank or a termite mound. Um, they feed almost ex exclusively on flying insects, especially dragonflies and butterflies and moths. Um, and after a, a jacobara has caught an insect, it beats it against a branch um, to kill it. Then it removes the wings before it swallows. Uh, the jacobars, for the most part, sight reject inedible butterflies um, and quickly snatch edible ones. So they learn to recognize the edible butterflies. Naive young jacobars did not show the same inhibition to attacking butterflies, but they didn't know the difference. So they would quickly taste, reject the uh, unacceptable ones. And this was the part that I found interesting that, that was mentioned uh, in, in the write-ups about this bird. The butterfly usually survived the taste test. <laughs> This is the seven inch cowbird, uh, but it, it's cowbird, but it's not a brood parasite. In fact, other cowbirds are nest parasites on this one, on the bay wing. And remember, we're still in our first day. Um, we're, we're, we're just getting started here. So, um, Adjacent to the uh, to the lodge where we we're staying, there's a small river. And they had a, a little 12 foot rowboat, aluminum rowboat. And so our guide took uh, took two of us out in this little boat. And uh, these black collared hawks uh, were uh, were fishing and making repeated passes uh, down to the water, pretty much ignoring us. In fact, they were coming so close that focusing the camera was a problem. And uh, this little boat, of course, uh, anytime anybody moved, the whole boat was rocking and that didn't help. But um, these guys, not surprisingly, lives mainly on, they live mainly on fish, but they also catch snakes and snails and turtles and small mammals. Um, they snatch the prey for the surface. They don't dive into the water uh, like an osprey. Uh, this bird is so unique, it's the only species in the genus. Um, these hawks <laughs> reselect their mates every year. Another great concept. But, <laughs> but they generally reuse their previous nest. <laughs> Um, it's a fairly large hawk, two feet tall, the wingspan of four and a half feet. And we were lucky to see them, let alone get such a, a, a good look at them because they're described as generally uncommon. With a body length of 16 inches, 
and a wingspan of 29 inches. This is a big kingfisher. And because of their size, they can hover only very briefly uh, before going into their dive. And when underwater, they use their wings for rowing. Um, and as you know, kingfishers all the, have a primary diet of fish, but these have been observed feeding on hummingbirds. The nest is in a burrow in a riverbank and uh, the eggs are laid on a layer of fish bones and, and scales. All right. A group of kingfishers is known as? Which? I came up with realm. <laughs> and again, this is the only member of the genus. It's about 40 inches tall, wingspan of five feet. The bill is the longest of any of the New World uh, herons. Uh, unusual for birds, both male and female, uh, uh, flaunt colorful courtship plumage uh, during the breeding season. It's sometimes called the hummingbird heron uh, because of its vivid plumage. Now, once again, this is described as reclusive and rarely seen. Um, but there was right on the river, river bank. We're sitting out there and uh, in the boat, the, the bird has gone about its business and I'm snapping happily away. Uh, just just lucky that we uh, we got to see it. Another fairly large bird, 19 inches tall, 25 inch wingspan. Um, I was in, in doing research on this, I was confused by the pictures that I was seeing online because they didn't match uh, my pictures at all until I read that there are no less than 21 subspecies of this bird. And to make things more complicated, it's only the juveniles that have the stripes that the species is named for. Why would anybody do that? <laughs> Just to conf confuse people. Uh, at one time, uh, it was thought that this bird was the same species as our green heron. Uh, they're, they're now separated, they're separate species, but they do share the the fishing technique where they'll use a feather or, a, or an insect as, as bait to attract small fish. So that's a lot uh, in the first couple of days that we're, that we're in Brazil. But now we're back on the uh, Transpantanera Road. We continue to the end at Port jo Joffrey. And then we get on a small boat and we're taken, taken up the river to the Millennium, which is to be our home for the next few days. I noticed that tall mast that uh, provides internet service. Even though we're in the middle of nowhere, we've got internet service. So this big floating hotel is just tied to a tree on the riverbank. But inside it's air conditioned, um, fully modern and, and uh, very comfortable. The rooms had ensuite bathrooms. Couldn't ask for anything better. But uh, so for from here for the next three days, all of our travel is going to be by boat. And it's certainly a lot better than traveling on that road. And uh, from now on, I've always got the camera in my hand because opportunities appear suddenly and often only last for a split second. So you better be ready. Now we're on a very um, um, secondary river and uh, we're here in the dry season and yet the flow is absolutely massive. And this is a secondary river. Uh, in this part of the Pantanal, it floods only to about one to two feet deep. 
Um, but the, the water is moving slowly um, through the vegetation, which is mostly grasses. Strangely enough, drought in between wet seasons is so uh, severe that trees can't grow there. In spite of, in spite of the fact that it's flooded for, for uh, uh, several weeks every year, there's very few trees. Um, but this slow movement of the water uh, through the grass allows for the deposition of, of sediments. And all along the river, you see the annual uh, sediment layers, uh, which are, are clearly visible. And in some areas, pure sand has been sorted out of the floodwaters. But it's interesting that because so much vegetation is is uh, flooded and is decomposing in the water, that causes the, 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 the shallow flood water to become oxygen deficient to the point where that, that can cause massive fish die-offs. Um, the, the fish do have adaptations to survive in oxygen depleted water, but nevertheless, it can ex exceed their uh, ability to adapt. These are called apple snails because they can grow to the size of an apple. And uh, their adaptation to these, uh, to the oxygen rich or uh, oxygen depleted water is that they have both gills and lungs. And um, so they can uh, extend a long snorkel to the water surface and breathe air. But they lay their eggs above the water. And, um, oh, but before I, I go on, uh, apple snails, because they're very easy to keep, they're very, popular among the uh, the pet trade and the, through that route have become invasive in many uh, warm water parts of the world. The bright color of the eggs is a warning that they contain a toxin. Spectacular bird, but there's almost nothing known about the biology. Uh, it's 30 inches tall, but I couldn't even find a wingspan measurement. So all I can do is show you the pictures. Um, and that's gonna have to be enough. Very frustrating for me trying to find information about uh, some of these birds. Um, this skimmer has a body length of 20 inches and a wingspan of four and a half feet. It's the largest of the three skimmer spe species, and um, they can live for up to 20 years. When they hatch, both, both mandibles are the same length, but the lower mandible grows until it is uh, considerably longer than the upper, and they feed by flying low over the water surface with the lower mandible skimming the water where it uh, sn uh, snatches up small fish and insects, crustaceans and mollusks, which are caught by touch by day or night. Now I watch these things feeding and they fly very fast, but as soon as something touches that, that bill, they were able to snap it closed quickly enough to, uh, uh, to, to, to eat it. And they fish that way by day and night. Uh, they have large dil dilated pupils so that they could see better uh, in, in the low light. And they are the only birds known to have pupils that constrict to vertical slip slits to protect their uh, their nocturnal eyesight from, from bright sunlight. This is the sole member of its entire family. That's pretty unique. Um, the, um, 
the genus name comes from the ancient Greek uh, Donicus, which means reed, and bios, which means mode of life, which is pretty descriptive of uh, where they live. <clears throat> He's about nine inches tall. It's a widespread bird in South America, but they seem to be have been ignored uh, or simply taken it uh, for granted by researchers because there's absolutely nothing um, uh, uh, known about their biology. He has a strange character. About 36 inches long, weighs about six and a half pounds. This is one that's uh, causing considerable um, concern because the population is um, declining quite rapidly. Um, and in fact, it's already been extirp extirpated from parts of its former range because of habitat dis destruction and hunting. Um, diet is primarily fruit, which it uh, feed picks up off the ground, but it will feed on insects and uh, and flowers. They have a peculiar crest, which is formed by feathers that lay flat, but have upturned tips. Uh, the female in the foreground here has white feathers with black upturned tips. That probably will remind you of something. Uh, the locals call it the judge. It's um, He's got a wingspan of about five feet, but uh, the black vulture is relatively small uh, as vultures go. Gro uh, yeah, um, it flies very high when foraging, watching for carrion or watching behavior of other uh, vultures. Um, these these guys are aggressive and they will often drive uh, turkey vul vultures uh, away from food. Again, the only member of the genus, uh, the large neck neck pouch is used to carry food and water to chicks in the nest. At five feet tall, the jabiru is the tallest flying bird found in South and Central America. The name comes from a South American native language, which means swollen neck. In uh, South America, it has the second largest wingspan which can be seven to nine feet. The only bird bigger than that is the Andean condor, which can be up to 10 feet, have a 10 foot wing wingspan. Again, the only species in the genus. Wingspan about three feet. Uh, it feeds mainly by plunge diving from 20 or 30 feet. And a group of terns is collectively known as, this one should be easy, a U of terns. Don't, don't you love these technical uh, birding terms? This guy has got a wingspan of about six feet. Um, they're primary land birds, but they're good swimmers and they have partially webbed feet. And their their loud courtship calls can be heard for two miles. And they have spurs on their wings, which are used in fights over mates and, and territorial uh, uh, disputes. And they, these spurs break off, but then they, they regrow. Uh, the chicks can run as soon as they as they hatch, but they're usually raised in or near water. And um, in the early days, they can swim better than they can run. So they will take to the water uh, if they're threatened. You're probably familiar with the capybara. It's the largest living rodent. 
Um, <coughs> the Tupi are a native people in Brazil and capybara is derived from Tupi words meaning grass eater. They can be two feet tall, weigh up to 200 pounds. Uh, they have three toes on their, on their rear feet and four toes on their front feet. And I know you are all really wondering about that. Um, capybaras are semi-aquatic. They're very good swimmers. They can hold their breath underwater for up to five minutes. And they're highly sociable. They hang out in groups, uh, sharing childcare, and even suckling each other's babies. And I think that's unique. I've never come across that in any other species. Uh, capybara can live up to uh, either eight to 10 years, but they usually in the wild live less than four years uh, because they are the favorite food of jaguars and pumas and ocelots and eagles and caiman. Capybara is also the pre preferred prey of the anacondas. And here there's a cattle tyrant um, on its back on the lookout for insects disturbed by the capybara. Um, the, the cattle tyrant's about eight inches long. Uh, and once again, it's the only species in its genus. The caiman are small crocodilians. In Brazil, ma males grow to a maximum of 10 feet, 130 pounds. Females are half that size. They take 15 years to reach uh, maturity and uh, maximum size. Their diet consists mostly on fish, but also includes snails and capybara. Poaching for meat and skins nearly wiped them out uh, in the Pantanal. But turns out that caiman are easy to farm. And so now farm caiman supply the entire market for meat and, uh, and skins. And that's taken the pressure off the wild populations. So today the, the population of uh, caiman in the Pantanal is estimated at around 10 million. Um, which is a good thing because as we're going to see, they have some surprising predators. The giant otters are huge members of the of the weasel family. Uh, they reach nearly six feet long, including the tail, can weigh 75 pounds. You know what our little river otters can smell like? Can you imagine what these guys would be like? Um, the... the um, can close their nostrils and their ears um, underwater. And again, this is the only species in the genus. Uh, before hunting decimated uh, the populations in the 1970s, preserved skins showed that they, that they once grew to upwards of eight feet. Eight foot otter. They live in family groups between five and, and eight uh, or more individuals. They're piscivores, which, meaning they prefer to eat fish, but they will also hunt uh, uh, snakes and small caiman. Each animal has a distinctive pattern of spots under its chin. And so uh, these are used for identification. They raise their necks out of the water when meeting other uh, otters. The, co the cocoi is the largest of the South American herons at four and a half feet tall. Uh, it's similar in size to our, our great blue heron. Uh, they can live up to 24 years uh, and the biology and behavior is similar to the to our great blue heron. But in the Pantanal, remember, this is not big an area. There are nine different heron species in that area. 
Uh, this chakalaka is about 18 inches long. Uh, they're described as very noisy. And in fact, chakalaka means chatterbox. They never shut up. So we're continuously seeing um, very exciting birds uh, continuously. But every minute that we're out on the river, we're on the lookout for the real prize of the Pantanal, and that's a jaguar. Uh, they patrol the riverbanks at, at um, uh, low water, uh, searching for their primary prey, which is capybara and surprisingly, caiman. <laughs> The jaguar's bite force adjusted for body size is the strongest of all the world's big cats. Um, they're good swimmers and they don't hesitate to plunge into the water after, after their prey. And they can actually crush the skull of a caiman. They're almost nine feet in length, including the tail, weigh around 200 pounds. And they have superior night vision, and they do much of their hunting in the dark. Uh, jaguars are threatened, uh, uh, are listed as threatened uh, because of loss of habitat and shooting by ranchers who lose cattle. But the jaguar ecotourism represents a gross annual income for the Pantanal of almost $7 million for the Pantanal. Compared to the estimated damage they could cause in killing cattle, which would amount to about $122,000. But the farmers still kill them because they believe that they are um, costing them money. So during the dry season, the jaguars are concentrated along the rivers and are fairly reliably seen. Uh, sometimes multiple animals will be encountered, and this gives a misleading impression of, of abundance. Uh, we were very lucky in, in the, the animal that we encountered. We only saw the one, but it totally ignored us in the boat. It was doing its hunting. Uh, we were uh, maybe 50 feet away on, on the beach and um, were able to just drift along uh, as, as the jaguar moved, taking pictures and um, jaguar just ignored us. It's about as good as it could get. So the jaguar was certainly the highlight of that particular day, but uh, we're far from finished with interesting birds. Uh, the yellow-headed vulture has a, a wingspan of almost six feet. It tends to soar at lower altitudes than other vultures because like its close relative, the turkey vulture, it hunts by, sa by scent. Uh, maybe you are all familiar with this, but very few birds have a sense of smell. And uh, the turkey vulture is, um, and this one is one of the, the few that do. So the, the, both the turkey vulture and this one uh, locate carrion by detecting this the scent of early a uh, scent of ethyl mercaptan, which is a gas produced by the beginnings of decay in dead animals. Um, it's that same gas is used by humans uh, by introducing it into pipelines. And then they can detect leaks in the pipelines by watching for circular, circu circling vultures. But if you've been listening to the Fortis um, advertisements about the smell of rotten eggs, it's mercaptan that they introduced into our natural gas. Um, 
I thought that was an interesting connection. So because uh, these guys have a superior, superior ability to locate carrion, uh, this vulture is often the first to arrive at a newly dead uh, animal, but it's frequently displaced by uh, on the carcass by lar larger vultures uh, that have followed it. But this often works in its favor since it's not strong enough to break into the hide of a recently dead animal. So the larger vultures open the, ca uh, the carcass and the lesser yellowhead uh, eventually is able to feed. About seven, seven and a half inches long, and once again, the only species in the genus. About 16 inches tall, inhabits wetlands, feeds at night. Well, there it is out in bright sunlight. Once again, I guess we were just really lucky to see it. Body length of two feet, pretty fairly big um, hawk, but it often hunts on foot for small reptiles and large insects. But it again, eats almost anything, including fruit and fish. It also rests, raids the nests of other birds where it takes eggs and, uh, and chicks. Its normal range is entirely tropical from Mexico south into South America. And uh, the peril, perils of vagrancy were, de were uh, demonstrated by a juvenile uh, great black hawk in 2018. Well, one, one of them appeared in Maine in August and eventually it died of frostbite in January. They have a wingspan of about four feet. This is a, a little guy. He was only six inches tall. Um, the genus name Vanellus is Latin for little fan. Uh, and then that's a reference to the sound the uh, wings make in flight. Um, there's lots of online mentions of this bird, but almost all of them are arguing over whether this should be considered a lapwing or a plover. And that discussion just seems to go on indefinitely. So after another um, we're, we've left the millennium now. We've traveled back up the Transpantanera Road um, to reach our next stop, which is a working ranch that combines ecotourism with horse breeding. And as we arrived, the blue and yellow macaws were putting on a show. Uh, this is a large bird with a body of about 30 four inches long, the wingspan of, of upwards of three feet. They can live 30 to 35 years in the, in the wild, but they're popular as pets. Properly cared for, they can live for up to 60 years. In fact, they are in the pet trade, they are sold with a warning that the bird might outlive its owner. There's apparently a record of one of them living for 112 years. Uh, they made for life. They lay two, or two to three eggs, but it's only the strongest chick uh, survives. Uh, the ranch also has a few of the spectacular and very vulnerable hyacinth uh, macaws with a body length of over 40 inches and a wingspan of four and a half feet, it's the largest of the macaws. They take seven years to reach sexual maturity um, and they are endangered by the pet trade. Again, almost all online mentions are about keeping them as pets. And the price of a captive bird, captive bird in the US can be up to $12,000. It's no wonder they're threatened in the wild. But a conservation project in the Pantanal uh, has helped them to double their population in 12 years. 
really nice to hear. There are six species of macaws in the Pantanal. Again, the only species in the family. Um, the name derives from it seeming to limp when it walks. And its diet is dominated by apple snails. And the bill has a uh, has adaptations to, to facilitate removing a snail from its shell. <coughs> For example, the, the tip of the bill curves slightly to the right, like the apple snail's shell. It takes only 10 to 20 seconds uh, for the bird to remove the snail from the shell without breaking the shell. You see the bird? The great potu. There it is there. It hides in plain sight. This is not a small bird either. It has a wingspan of about 30 inches. And even when you spot it, it's hard to make out what you're looking at. Here we have a mom and a chick. There are seven species of uh, patus. Uh, the great patu is the largest of them. Uh, they're nocturnal. They have excellent nice night vision and they fly in the dark with those big mouths wide open. The diet consists of, not surprisingly, flying insects like moths, um, and we'll take wing, wing beetles as well. And it spends the day camouflaged in a tree. The great patu can see with its eyes closed. Uh, they're born with special notches on their upper eyelids that allow them to see and sense movement even when their eyes are closed. Uh, if you're going to spend all day sleeping, that seems like a pretty good idea to be able to spot something sneaking up on you. Now, parakeets, we tend to think of as little birds, but this one can be up to 20 inches long. Um, and this is the only parrot that does not nest in a cavity. Instead, it builds a bulky structure of sticks that can house a single nest or a complex with a dozen or more separate uh, nest chambers. Um, and it occupies this stick nest uh, the year round. And um, it sleeps in the nest at night and generally doesn't wander uh, far from it. The horses of the Pantanal have evolved to survive in this watery environment. Uh, the hooves don't get the fungus infections that would cause the hooves to literally fall off a regular horse uh, because of the, of the constant wetness. And they can close their nostrils when they're, when they're grazing underwater. <clears throat> Body of this parakeet is about 12 inches long, two foot wingspan. And uh, they have a rather strange habit of falling asleep, lying on their back. <laughs> <laughs> there are seven parakeet species uh, and taken together with the macaws and other related birds, there are a total of 18 parrots in the Pantanal. You begin to, to see why, why I was reluctant to call this talk the birds of <laughs> Brazil. This one has short rounded wings to help them uh, maneuver uh, uh, through the forest. Uh, they're about 15 inches long. And when they leave the forest to forage, they fly singly so as not to draw attention. And I don't know where names come from. Uh, this is obviously not a cardinal. It's, uh, it's more likely a tanager. 
about seven inches long and it's a seed and fruit eater. And here's another cardinal. Well, and it's not a cardinal either. It also is a tanager. He's about eight inches long. <laughs> and you never know what you're going to encounter. This cute little guy was nosing around. They don't see very well. And so even though I was right in front of him, uh, he didn't know I was there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I think he's probably trying to to sniff me. They they have poor eyesight, but a uh, good sense of smell. Um, armadillo. Does anybody know what that means? It's a Spanish word for little armored one. It's a pretty appropriate name. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that this is uh, related to our robin. But with all these spectacular birds to choose from, this is the national bird of Brazil. <laughs> and for, it, apparently it has a very nice song and uh, is widely heard and it's it's chosen as the natural, uh, the national bird because it features prominently in Brazilian literature and myths and, and songs. And it's it's not even found all over Brazil. It's only in the south south uh, east of the of the country. <laughs> it migrates within Brazil, so in winter. It moves south, <laughs> but still stays in the same country. <clears throat> but nine inches long, feeds on large insects, which is catch, which it catches in mid-flight. And uh, as you can see here, it it beats the prey to death on a on a branch before it before it uh, eats it. You can see literally the pieces flying off the insect. This is a relatively large uh, falcon. There's a body length of up to 22 inches, the wingspan of 37 inches. And uh, the English name a lot in this case is right on. It's call really sounds like a like a human laughter. Um, and the species name is Latin for laughing aloud. It's also called the snake hawk. It's a specialist snake eater and mainly catches snakes, including venomous species. <laughs> uh, this was a really interesting location. Uh, many thousands of years ago, a huge underground cavern collapsed, allowing the rock above to drop, creating a sinkhole that's bigger than a football field and deeper than a 30-story building. And all around the walls of this um, sinkhole, numerous pairs of uh, macaws, red and green macaws, are nesting in the crevices. Um, these birds are three feet long with a wingspan of over uh, four feet. It makes them the second largest macaw. Uh, only the, the hyacinth um, macaw is bigger. Um, and this is the wi most widespread of the macaws, but it's threatened. <coughs> in recent years, there's been a marked decline in the population uh, due to both um, habitat loss and the illegal uh, pet trade. The beak can generate pressures up to 2,000 pounds per square inch, which allows them to open the hardest seeds. Uh, and compare that to a human bite force, which is only 150 pounds per square inch. You don't want one of them uh, 
nibbling on your finger. They can fly, fly 35 miles per hour and uh, getting these photographs for you to uh, look at was a real challenge. Uh, they would dash out from the cliff. They're, they're in view for seconds. And in that time, you have to compose and, and uh, focus. And I'm even trying to get uh, nice backgrounds. Once again, these guys can live for up to 60 years. Beautiful birds. With a body length of 30 inches, this is a fairly large ibis. Uh, his nesting habits are peculiar. They, they uh, are seen as solitary nests, but they also will nest in large groups. There are, there are five ibis species in the Pantanal. Um, that's all I could find on it. This is a beautiful medium-sized owl, um, about 15 inches tall. And it has cinnamon colored eyes. Um, the striped owl uh, uh, has an enormous range covering most of Central and South America. But as you can see in this range map, it, it shows an unexplained uh, peculiarity. The bird does not enter the Amazon basin. Um, and I could find no explanation for that. So I suspect it simply isn't known. So we're back on the road and uh, keeping a sharp eye out, which is rewarded by this, this huge giant anteater. He is a giant, seven feet long. Weighs up to 100 pounds, and his diet is entirely ants and termites. <coughs> um, the tongue is 18 inches long and covered with backward pointing hairs and sticky saliva. The tongue can lip, lick up insects at three times per second, and the mouth opening is just, just large enough for the tongue. And they use formic acid from their prey for digestion. The rheas stand about five feet tall and weigh up to 80 pounds. Uh, females move around during bre breeding season, mating with, uh, uh, with a male, depositing eggs with the male before leaving him to mate with another male. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move from Pantanal to the Atlantic rainforest. Unfortunately, there's little left of the Atlantic rainforest. More than 85% of it has been cleared, uh, and what remains is highly fragmented. Um, uh, it re the the bits that remain are extraordinarily lush, and the bio the biodiversity and endemic species um, uh, is amazing. Uh, and many of them are threatened with a, with a extinction. The Atlantic forest alone is home to eight hundred and ninety one bird species. And now we finally have an opportunity to photograph hummingbirds. Wait, we literally haven't seen any up to this point. Uh, it's pretty obvious where the swallowtail name comes from. Uh, the white tufts around the ankles uh, are also characteristic of this species. They primarily feed on flower nectar uh, they aggressively defend feeding areas against all birds, including much larger species. They can also they also take insects, particularly when the females um, are feeding young. The, the young need protein, which they won't get from nectar. 
Uh, it's a long slim bird at, at six and a half inches. It's one of the larger hummingbirds. Female can may raise two broods in a se uh, two broods in a season, and uh, reuse the same nest. This is an interesting looking hummingbird, but there's absolutely no um, uh, information available on it. I couldn't even find a measurement. It's described as one of the larger hummingbirds. Uh, uh, they don't maintain and defend feeding territories uh, like other hummingbirds. And and this is the difference. They're, they are called trap line feeders. They regularly patrol a, a route uh, that may be half a mile long, feeding as they go. Um, the female builds a remarkable cone-shaped nest, which hangs by a, a single cable of spider's web uh, from some overhead support. It's also called the turquoise honey creeper, uh, which is uh, misleading because they're not humming and they're not honey creepers. Um, they are, in fact, uh, tanagers. The female is totally different, but also a beautiful bird. Uh, as depleted as it is, the Atlanta grain forest has no less than 36 species of tanagers. This is hummingbirds about four inches long. Um, the bill is about three quarters of an inch and the tongue is one and a half inches. So the tongue is almost an inch longer than the beak. Um, and of course the, the long bill and the, and the long tongue are adaptation to feed from deep tubular shaped birds, uh, sorry, flowers, excuse me. Uh, this one's about 10 inches long, feeds on fruits and insects. You never know what you're going to run into. These are endemic to Brazil. <clears throat> and in fact, they only survive in the remnants of the Atlantic rainforest. <clears throat> it's a four inch finch described as small, colorful, sweet singing um, resonant. Euphonia, the species name means pleasing to the ear. Um, this is a, a forest bird and all its bright colors are good camouflage in the forest. Um, they not only flaunt about six different colors, their plumage has an opalescent quality. In the right light, they literally glow. About six and a half inches long. Uh, the ruby crown refers to a red patch, which is usually concerned, concealed on top of its head. Uh, they only raise this hidden crest during courtship displays. <coughs> Again, the female looks completely different. Um, small tanager, about five and a half inches long. Sings a lively and pleasant, but described as repetitious song. All right, here's another good one. A group collectively referred to as a charm of finches or a trembling of finches. Uh, 
Um, these these uh, hummingbirds are entirely solitary. They have nothing to do with other hummingbirds at all. There's no pair bond in this species and the female is left to build a nest and raise young entirely alone. Uh, that seems sad, but maybe there's an upside. The male gets to, to mate with a number of females and the female goes on to do the same. Um, her nest is made of plant material lined with soft fibers and animal hair and is reinforced with spider web, which gives it an elastic quality that allows the nest to expand as the chicks grow. The upward caught tail is a characteristic when it's hovering to feed. Uh, the somber hummingbird is, uh, is a forest bird and the dusky plumage allows it to blend into the shadows. <clears throat> it's about five inches long and uh, it's endemic to Brazil. This is a very small hummingbird, three or four inches. Um, and again, virtually no biological uh, information available for this one. Uh, it has no less than six very similar subspecies. And that's possibly the reason why no one has undertaken to, uh, to study it in detail. It's too confusing. about seven inches long and it's endemic to the Atlantic rainforest. <clears throat> it doesn't bell we uh, bode well for a lot of these species because uh, that Atlantic rainforest continues to disappear. We hear a lot about uh, problems in the Amazon, but the Atlantic rainforest has suffered uh, far more This is another Atlantic rainforest endemic, about 10 inches long. And uh, even though it's not rare today, uh, even the Cornell Bird Lab states that it is surprising that so little is known about its biology. So I literally can't tell you anything about it. Um, this is an easy species to identify. The female has a white front with a prominent black stripe, and the male has an entirely black uh, front. Um, these birds are about four inches long. And once again, no biological information. This one is recorded as eating 36 different kinds of fruit. There we go. Obviously it's named for the brilliant red throat patch um, on the male. The female does not have that red throat, throat patch. And again, this is the only species in the genus. Um, and again, in, endemic to the Atlantic rainforest. But nine inches long, um, seems to be disagreement over to, uh, uh, over which family these should belong to. Again, it's caught up in the, in uh, disagreements over whether they should be called considered cardinals or tanagers. He's about eight inches long, found only in the Atlantic rainforest and dependent on intact forest. Now this was a complete new one to me, the Tyra. It's a, uh, an omnivorous animal from the uh, in the weasel family, 
head to tail. It's over four feet long. And it's at home on the ground or in the trees and in the water. It's able to walk and climb skillfully like a cat. And it's an excellent swimmer. It's mainly active at night. And so once again, we were lucky to see it at all. Uh, they, they live in nests in hollow trees and in underground burrows. This is a small parrot, about 11 inches tall. Um, they, they hang around in flocks of uh, usually six to 12 individuals, but may, maybe up to 40 birds in a flock, mainly feed on fruit. And um, this brown um, and sometimes white eye patch is characteristic of this species. And they can live to 30 years old. There's an astonishing 51 species of woodpeckers um, in Brazil. This one's about seven inches long. Um, like most South American birds, their diet leans heavily towards fruits, but also includes seeds and insects. Um, the yellow-fronted woodpecker breeds cooperatively with up to four males and two to three females attending a single nest. They all take part in um, nesting duties, feeding the chicks, cleaning the nest, and defending the site. The toucans are nest predators, uh, not only eating the young, but competing for um, suitable ne uh, nest holes in trees. And that's the end of my story. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Can everyone hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, on Zoom and on the floor. Yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, makes me wish I could actually go and do some traveling. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Uh, before I open it to other people's questions, um, I just wanted to ask about the the pet trade in, in in the macaw. Are they trying to do anything to stop that? I didn't. I didn't come across any reference to um, enforcement. Uh, so I can't. I can't. I don't have an answer for you. It doesn't seem like there's much being done. Yeah. Um, so but to tell you the truth, I, I I didn't pursue that. It just kind of is uh, so off-putting. It's their habitat. Yeah. That's um, most unfortunate. Yes. Okay, I don't see anything on the chat. Do people have questions? Audrey? I do. Um, yes. The, <laughs> the loss of the Atlantic forest, 85% of it gone, is, was that for developing coffee plantations? It, it's farming generally. Um, flying over that area, the uh, it, it it really strikes home that Thank you. that um, uh, there's little patches of trees here and there, but most of it is open fields. Um, I'm not sure what all they're growing there. We tended to stay in the patches of trees, uh, mm -hmm. but it's just farming. And um, uh, no, uh, no attempt to control that. It seems like, and it has been going on for a long time. Is is there much activity? Are there um, many organizations that you heard of that have, are concerned about this, with the extinction of some of the creatures who lived there? Uh, as far as the Atlantic um, rainforest is concerned. I came across nothing along those lines. Now, I was 
primarily looking for information uh, about the birds. And so there might be more more information out there, um, but I didn't dig it out. And my last question, how long was your trip? Um, in total, three weeks. Uh, from, from here, uh, we went and spent uh, the better part of the last week in Ecuador, um, which I have to go back to because I didn't get enough pictures on mm -hmm. those, those few days for a slideshow. So that's that. when I can travel again, that's my next trip. <laughs> thank you. That was most interesting. Thank really you. enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. Excellent. It was super. People we have, have some questions, questions here, uh, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, Sid Barber with a question. Actually, a three prong question. Did you? Ron, about okay. the I said there was one to oh, turn it off. <laughs> turn us off. Hey, the, uh, the turn it off. <laughs> I said it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Turn us off. You alluded to the land use, but perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on the land use, land tenure, and the security of the uh, of that that incredible house. Uh, obviously, that's an aspect that I didn't expect to be of such great interest. Uh, I all, I need to do much more research on that because I have no answers for your questions. Mostly ranching, though. Um, I, I no, I think it's it's farming. They they look like plowed fields. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the Catalan is the big thing in the Pantanal, although we saw enormous areas newly cleared for soybean production. Oh. Um, but whether it's uh, the Atlantic rainforest, whether they're growing soybe soybeans down there or not, I don't know at this point. Yeah, it was the Pantanal that I was particularly yeah. interested. Yeah, well, in the Pantanal, yes. It's, mo it's mostly ranching. Um, How many what? Yeah. Oh, how many actually birds? Yes. Oh, nests. In the sinkhole. Um, I don't think anybody has, uh, has counted them. Be thousands? Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not in the thousands. Uh, maybe a few dozen. Just, um, and I'm just going by the numbers of pairs of birds that I saw flying around. Um, the the whole area wasn't constant movement of of uh, of flying birds. Um, so yeah, probably a few dozen, three dozen, maybe. Um, Do you know how many birds have gone extinct in, in, in Brazil that they know of? I didn't come across that information. I think a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there has to be. I've been there. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's just such a big problem. I don't think anybody has yeah. any way of, of even estimating it. Because there's a lot of stuff there that... It, it, has not even been described yet. So how can you know when it's when it disappears? I was there, I had some good friends there. And he had he had a pet bird. It, the bird's not extinct in the wild. It's a famous bird, you probably know about it. It's got a wonderful song. I can't remember the name of it, but it's mm. famous all over Brazil. It maybe it's got the most beautiful song of any bird in Brazil. Oh. And it's on the famous bird clock that they have. There's a 12 species of toast in 12 hours of the day. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's on that clock. Any Brazilian knows this. But I forgot that. <laughs> but the bird's extinct. He's got he has a pet bird. They're, they're only kept alive in captivity now. So I, I'm wondering how many more birds have gone extinct. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yes. Uh, well, I was wondering if there was. Uh... 
any relationship with the damage, the threat of damage to the personnel compared to the, the amplification. Uh, are they about equally uh, endangered? Or uh, I, my impression is that the uh, the destruction of the uh, the Atlantic rainforest has been going on longer than what's been happening in um, the uh, the Amazon, uh, and it was a smaller area to begin with, so uh, it's not taken that much to destroy a whole lot of it. But uh, you guys have got to, going, to, going to be sending me right back to start researching this talk all over again because obviously uh, you're not asking questions about the photography or the birds. You want to know about the, the conservation, which uh, I didn't anticipate. So um, the next audience will get, well, I'll be more prepared. <laughs> Sorry about that. So now I'm going to ask you a question about the, uh... the edible. Now I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know whether the, the formic acid that it uses to digest it it, it, its food would uh, make the the meat inedible. I didn't come across any reference to it being um, endangered by hunting. They're just, but they're not common uh, by any means. So. <laughs> yes. Um, I. Uh, uh, in, in Central and South America, your best opportunities for photography and actually for observing birds um, is with a, a, a bird photography guide, a photography guide, as opposed to a pure birding guide. Um, when you go with a birding guide, you're in a huge group of people walking along the trail. The guide has a telescope, he'll spot something 300 meters away and set up the telescope and everybody takes turns. Well, when you're the photography guides take you to lodges and very often small family owned properties where the family maintains a set of feeders and um, charges a, a small amount and the guides bring, um, uh, bring their clients uh, so th this is where uh, a lot of the pictures uh, came from. Now there's a, a bit of a story here. These feeding stations, uh, people are, are coming there from all over the world. And they're not just photographers, they're tourists that are being brought there to see the birds. When I'm there, I like to go and sit quietly, enjoy nature while I'm waiting for the birds to show up. You would be amazed at how few people have figured that out. <laughs> so there's always, with the, whenever there's other people around, there's always movement and, and, and talk and stuff going on. And the birds are not coming to that. So, um, there was one one at one lodge uh, which had a nice array of hummingbird feeders and a good variety of hummingbirds. At dinner one night, it became uh, obvious that everybody that was staying at that lodge, including my own guide, were the next day was going off to different places. There was going to be nobody at the lodge. Aha! <laughs> okay, so I I told them I'm staying. I figured I'd have the hummingbirds all to myself for the whole next day. Well, I did for two hours. <laughs> and then I heard a bus pull in behind me. <laughs> and I heard I'm ignoring it. But I could hear a group of people come down from the bus. 
and they head straight for the hummingbird feeders. I could hear them walking up behind me. But they got behind me, right behind me, and stopped and were quiet. They were just watching the birds over my shoulder. Every once in a while, there'd be a click of a camera, but that was the only sound. Mm -hmm. Really well-behaved people. <laughs> Eventually, I got talking to them. They were Canadians. <laughs> uh, so, the, if, if depending on if you're going to South America, depending on whether you're interested in just seeing as many birds as possible or really getting a close look at at them and the availability of of watching them, um, go with a photography guide. You're going to get a much more intimate um, experience with the birds. So I guess we're done, right? I think we may be done. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much, Ron. That was that was wonderful as always. And we'll look forward to the next time. <laughs> yeah, see you next year, Elizabeth. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, and if we get our nature and focus thing going on, you'll be definitely be contacted. Uh, yes. Did Jeff get a chance to give you your poster? Yes. Okay, I good. It. I have it. Very nice. Okay, so, so I'll mail you.